The Faye Richards Photo Archive, made between 1993 and 1996, consists of 82 black and white and color photographs, photo captions, and a cast list. Conceived and fabricated for Cheryl Dunne's 1996 film, The Watermelon Woman, the photographs document the life of Faye Richards, a fictional black lesbian <coughs> actress, singer, and civil rights activist. They take a variety of forms, snapshots of family, friends, and lovers, film stills, publicity stills, headshots, and glamour shots. The earliest photographs depict Faye as a teenager, the white family for whom she worked as a servant and through whom she met Martha Page, who would give Faye her first role as a maid and with whom Faye would have a long romantic relationship. We see the two enjoying uh, a, a picnic at a nightclub with friends and at their home in Hollywood Hills. As the archive continues, film stills reveal Faye as she is repeatedly typecast in roles such as the maid and the mammy before leaving Martha and abandoning Hollywood altogether for her hometown of Philadelphia, where she joins an all-black film studio, Liberty Pictures. She gets involved with Philadelphia chapter of the NAACP. She becomes part of an artistic community. Faye finally lands a lead role in Liberty Pictures Folds. She begins regularly performing in nightclubs. She meets June Walker, the love of her life, who becomes her partner until Faye's untimely death in 1974 at the age of 66. Shot in New York City in Philadelphia, each photograph was staged for historical historical accuracy, printed to simulate the era, and treated to give the appearance of age by eight different people in a dark room. While originally created as props for The Watermelon Woman, which follows a queer filmmaker named Cheryl as she tries to track down information about an early 20th century actress, the photographs have since been shown together as an independent work utilizing the conventions of an archive. And here I want to I want to stress that the work is always presented in a vitrine um, and accompanied by uh, both photo captions and a cast list. Um, the inclusion of the cast list is uh, significant, and we'll probably talk about this as it um, as it articulates a will towards transparency, um, a desire that a viewer understand that the archive, a archive, is constructed, and that the photographs depict actors such as Lisa Marie Bronson who plays the fictional Faye. And this is an install view at MOCA, here at MOCA. In addition to the archive as object, the work also exists in book form, um, published by Artspace Books in 1996 and containing 73 of the 82 images. Um, here's another shot. Uh, and I also want to note that the first time the work was shown was in the 1997 Whitney Biennial. Um, so we also, we talked a bit and we thought maybe the first thing to do would actually uh, watch the part of the Watermelon Woman, Shell Dunny's film, in which we see the archive. Um, I'm going to confess this is the end, but I don't think it ruins anything for any of you who haven't seen it, and I would encourage that you do because it's fantastic. So we'll watch that now. But what she means to me a 25-year-old black woman means something else. It means hope, it means inspiration, it means possibility, it means history. And, and most importantly what I understand is that I'm going to be the one who says, I am a black lesbian filmmaker who's just beginning. But I'm going to say a lot more and have a lot more work to do. Anyway. What y'all have been waiting for, the biography of the watermelon woman, Faye Richards, Faith Richardson. The first record of Faye that I could find was this photo, Faith Richardson, winner of the Beachy Beecham Bicarbonate Jingle Contest, Philadelphia, 1922. I know that she worked as a maid for several years, and I know that she danced in the chorus on South Street, but I'm not sure how she got into her first film. She must have met Martha Page at some club or something. This one is stamped Newark Studios, and on the back it says, The Watermelon Woman and Sandra Vincent in Jersey Girl, 
1931. I think this is Faye's first film with Paige. In fact, I know it is. And from what I can tell, this is the beginning of their relationship both on and off the screen. Newark Studios' biggest hit was the 1933 film, Louisiana Lady. Martha scored with this one and got her ticket to Hollywood. Faye scored too. She was signed with Silver Star Studio and played in several of their movies, usually as a household maid or cook. Mr. Owen meets his match with Claude Thornton and the Watermelon Woman, 1937. This was a big year for Faye. In 1937, she also starred in my all-time favorite, Plantation Memories. This one's titled, Elsie Calls on the Lord. I wrote to the studio and got these glamorous photos of Faye taken in 1938. It looks like she was trying to bust out of the mammy rolls, but of course in 1938, that couldn't really work. Oh, don't cry, Missy. That's the child is coming back for sure. I know he is. Do you really think so, Missy? is a big year for Faye. I don't know what happened between her and Martha, but she definitely moved back to Philly. She really worked hard at becoming the film star she wanted to be. Faye no longer calls herself the Watermelon Woman. In all of her films at Liberty Studio, she goes by the name Faye Richards. for being a tramp, but for being poor and living on the streets like I've had to do. Why can't I be happy fitting into their world? God made me this color and he did it for a reason. Faye worked it at Liberty Studios. J. Liberty cast her as a lead in all kinds of black cast films comedies, melodramas, and even gangster pictures. Problem is, she never got her chance to be a big star because black cast films were on their way out. So, in the 40s, Faye started singing again all over Philly. At the Standard, at the Dunbar, Peps, she had quite a following. The next picture I have of her is not until 1957, and it's kind of sad to see what happened to her because it looks like she stopped performing. But it's also kind of good, because she met June Walker, a special friend, who took care of her until the day she died. so good to see that. <laughs> I could just keep watching it. Um, so I thought we might, as a way to begin, um, think about something we talked about in our conversations earlier, which um, was what you brought up, Huey, which is um, an interest in talking about the Faye Richards photo archive in relation to historian Cydia Hartman's um, what she calls uh, critical fabulation. Um, the term first, appear, first appears in her 2008 text, Venus in Two Acts, um, in which, among other things, she's addressing the absence of first-person accounts of female slaves um, and the impossibility of, of telling such histories with all, without all other utterances in their names coming to stand for them. Um, I'm wondering if you could elaborate a bit on Hartman's critical fabulation as a methodology, um, uh, a means of writing, uh, of narrating history, and perhaps then we can all sort of try and talk about it in relation to 
uh, Zoe Leonard's work. Yeah, of course. Um, so, I mean, Hartman, in that essay, Venus and Two Acts, in a way is kind of returning to and trying to revise some of her own previous work. So in 2007, she published this incredible book, Lose Your Mother, A Journey Along the Transatlantic uh, Slave Route, where she was trying to think about well, what does it mean to return to these sites of slavery as an African-American and how to do so in a way that's ethical and not about a certain fantasy of restoration of some Edenic notion of Africa. And as part of that, it's this engagement with that archive of slavery, which there are so few traces that we have. And so often she's finding these traces of Venus, right, um, who is, you know, variously identified as a prostitute, as a brothel owner, um, but becomes a figure of the way in which black women um, in this moment are kind of crushed by the archive and we only have evidences, evidence of their existence through um, matters related to their ter they're being terrorized or murdered. And so the case of Venus that she really focuses on is this young girl who we know about because of a dispute from 1792 over insurance, right? And there's this tiny mention of her. And so for Hartman, the question becomes, well, how do I think about this subject lost to the archive without trying to give her a voice or produce a certain fantasy of perhaps the kinds of relationships or alternative ways of being she had despite the extreme you know, conditions of her life and her death. So she's really trying to problematize what it is to you know, narrate that history without it becoming uh, a kind of romance. And she develops this notion of critical fabulation because that's for her a way of trying to think about, well, there are all these things that we know, but there are also things, things that we can't verify, right? And so how can that be a kind of space for thinking other possibilities that also underline the kind of fundamental impossibility that she's engaging with? I think for me, I've always thought about you know, Hartman's model in relationship to this project, to the Faye Richards photo archive because there is a certain kind of critical fabulation that's happening here in this work. But unlike Hartman, who's very much as a historian feels bound by a particular archive and what is present there, I think what's so exciting about what uh, Faye and Cheryl, or what Cheryl and Zoe do in the artistic field is to actually produce an archive, right? To actually produce an archive that is fictionalized, that allows for an engagement with this particular figure, underlining both the incredible desire for that figure and for traces of her, even as she, she's, they're looking to Dorothy Arzner's life, they're looking to Butterfly McQueen, aspects of real lives, but trying to figure out, you know, in the context of this film, what is this kind of object of fantasy? Um, but even in the state that we receive it, um, as kind of Hartman underlines, it's an archive that's filled with holes and absences. It's very much contingent upon what was preserved at particular moments, what moments were deemed as sort of being photographable, photographable or worthy of remembering. So I think that, you know, crit that the Hartman's notion of critical fabulation provides an interesting way to think about some of the Dis risks and dangers of returning to an archive for a historian, but also the kind of possibilities that get opened up for creative play and practice. And I think, you know, in Garrett, your work in America, this astonishing, astonishing film that everyone should see when they get a moment, because it's everything, just advance plug. Um, there is, again, this kind of engagement with the archive and understanding you know, what the limitations of that are, but being able to use that as a kind of spur to open onto these other kinds of affective histories that we need in the present. So, I mean, I think both projects are motivated by a kind of counterfactual, what might have been, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that there's something uh, really interesting about, and when you sort of read about how Cheryl and Zoe talk about the work, it's, it is actually, it, it's fabricated, but it's also very much rooted, again, in fact, and in sort of what other actresses were doing. And what I love about looking at these images is that you really start to see, not the humor, but just the extreme yeah. fallacy of the characters that she was playing in cinema, because the way in which it's juxtaposed to the reality of her joyful and beautiful life yes. is, I think, one of the biggest takeaways kind of 
of the whole work in a lot of ways is it puts things, it resituates our perspective um, on, on a history. Um, and it doesn't necessarily replace anything. Yes. And I think too, I mean, we were, we were talking about how, I mean, this project is one that it actually makes me want to go further into the archive. I'm like, because, you know, there's always, you know, moments and histories and found footage that are kind of bubbling up at any moment. And it makes that um, desire for keeping that process of interrogation of the archive and trying to think about what histories have been included or lost that can be brought back into a view, something kind of really active through the very form that it takes. But I think there's also a way, too, to speak to another one of your points, Garrett, that, um, this kind of emphasis on um, the fictional or constructed quality of it is one that is taking the archive as a form but is not totally bound by it. And I see, I think we see that in your film as in your film as well, in the sense that, you know, the archive historically, what it might give us to see is perhaps deadly and terrifying and pernicious, but that's not necessarily what we need to take away from it in terms of what we need in the present. And I think that's something that, you know, I see animating Hartman's work and this, uh, your work and also Zoe and Cheryl's collaboration, you know, how can we look to the archive and the archive as a form in order to think about the kinds of images and joy that we need for ourselves in the present to continue our work? And which I would say also like have to be based on these assumptions. Like I think that that's also what's really interesting is making a positive assumption, which mm -hmm. is something that I think we, you know, serves a very important purpose right now in our country and um, in the work itself. I mean, there were times at least within regards to America, you know, looking at dates, for instance, like the Boy Scouts of America were incorporated in 1916. When I think about America, I think about, I mean, when I think about Boy Scouts, I think about a very white version of America. Mm -hmm. So what does it mean to insert my own community into that historical yes. fact? And it's based on an assumption in the same way that the series that we're seeing in these images of joy and playfulness uh, and beauty are based on an, an assumed life, you know, that isn't always highlighted. I think, yeah, I mean, to, to come to this idea of joy, I mean, I think t two things, I think one, and Fred Moten talks a little bit about this in his text in the catalog for this show, is, um, you know, I really understand Faye Richards' archive as being, you know, a work that evolved at the same time that Zoe Leonard was making Strange Fruit, which is a work where she stitched together pieces of fruit that had been then left to, to desiccate. There, yeah, you see it behind me. Um, as well as Tree, which is on view here. And those are works that I think are very devastating in their melancholy and their mourning. And I think there's a way in which the Faye Richards archive acts almost contrapuntally to that. There's this kind of like yeah. abundance of seeing this life that is filled with joy, as you're saying, um, and that that joy is actually seen in the gaps or the more private moments. Um, and I see that, and I, I think you, you see this in America as well, is like there's this emphasis um, in the Faye Richards archive, and I think in America as well, is of these moments of actual like, tactile connection, physical mm. connection, this idea of people actually touching and physically being together, this kind of incredible tenderness of physicality yes. that you see in both works, um, which I think is really extraordinary, because we think of an archive as really being a site of sort of facts or mm. records, mm -hmm. but to say that the fact of the record is the fact of the record of people being together and being in, in time together. Right. Yeah, and I'll say just to add to like, you know, inter thinking about the sort of third layer of Cheryl's piece and how her relation, her character's relationship then of having an interracial relationship in the 90s mm -hmm. and that being reflected from the archive that we're seeing in the film and frankly the invisibility of Watermelon Woman as a film in and of itself, which is starting to, you know, get its due. Um, again, it just adds to all these layers, layers also of like of touch and intimacy and and like how relevant still that is. Um, why? Why is it still a thing? And it is, it's still a thing. Well, yeah, I mean, I think it's a, um, to sort of play around with what we're talking about in terms of the archive and to be like specific is that um, what the work does is it puts into question this belief of archives or um, like highlights the fact that an archive is always constructed, um, that it's always and oftentimes um, made from positions of power, white, heterosexual and male and sort of weaves its way around and through that and um, but so interesting to talk about the way that we see it because I also experience looking at that work and and 
and getting a sense of the joy and pleasure of um, of what it meant for uh, Faye Richards as a woman to share her life with friends and family and um, but when you read interviews with Zoe she talks a lot about um, the sort of crisis she had as a white woman about making what she felt were often um, stereotypical or racially tinged images um, that she was uncomfortable with. She talks about having um, uh, to ask Lisa Marie Bronson to kneel down and pray in the costume of, of Mammy and like how um, that sort of level of, of discomfort. So I think it's interesting that right now we're able to see and get into those sort of moments of, of pleasure because there's also another narrative there as well that's a bit more sinister or um, I don't know if yeah I mean I think that's true but I think that's kind of one of the interesting achievements of the work that I mean because of the way and because of the kinds of photographs that we have left to us in this construction it's clear the kinds of omission the kinds of violence the kinds of discrimination that a Faye Richards confronted and that's very much um, part of the logic behind what photographs are there and how she's figured in a certain kind of mise-en-scene. So I think you never lose sight of that kind of structural violence and imposition as the kind of ground for the work. But at the same time, even within that, right, there are these kind of spaces of possibility, of kind of joy that can emerge. So, I mean, I think about, um, you know, um, it's a, a great phrase from the Afro-pessimist theorist Frank Wilderson, he says, you know, black folks live in the space of social death, but that doesn't mean we don't have tremendous life and joy in that space of death, right? And I think by sort of focusing on that and being able to read that um, through the images and their stage staging, it forces us to be able to hold that kind of contradiction and tension, right, of yes, all the kinds of heteronormative, racist, <laughs> um, um, patriarchal exclusions, but at the same time, that can never be the sum of Faye Richards's life. It's not one or, another, or the yeah. other, yeah. yeah. I would say also just to the point that you um, had mentioned, Rebecca, about the transparency and the importance of sort of the credit list, mm -hmm. is that the process by which this work is being made, I think, is also just as, if not more powerful than maybe these nuanced moments that she mentions of, you know, as I was giving direction to her to, to be on her knees or to do this thing, you know, I was made aware of a potential power dynamic. To me, that almost seems... Um, it's almost it's, it's not it's almost inconsequential on some level yeah. because um, the point is they were coming at it from equal footing mm -hmm. and you see that in the credits list and I think that um, you know that's a question that as filmmakers and, and artists or collaborate when we think about collaboration that's an ongoing conversation mm -hmm. at least in the film world mm -hmm. right now about how do white filmmakers make films that are not about the community that they're from and is it actually a solution to go to a non-white filmmaker and say I can't make this film can you make it with me is that really a solution is that really equal yeah. footing that's a much larger conversation but I think that what they achieved here was very much equal footing um, it was truly it seems to me a collaboration and you see that just even you know it says Zoe Leonard photographer Cheryl Dunier filmmaker they were in it together you know and I think there's interesting moments where you actually see a little bit of a self-awareness about that, I mean, not a little, a lot of self-awareness about that dynamic, dynamic in the photographs. I mean, there was an image that just passed by where you see Martha Page directing Faye and mm -hmm. you know, she's got this like very stern kind of directorial yeah. thing going on. And there is, you know, a visibility to actually those unequal power dynamics and all of that awkwardness yes. is allowed to circulate in the photographs mm -hmm. themselves too. No, I think, I mean, that's such a, such a great point that there's a way in which, um, there's a certain kind of meta level happening in terms of what's being pictured and the actual process of it. And we were talking earlier, it's like, you know, Zoe is from Liberty, New York. Liberty Pictures is the studio. So there's a way in which these interesting kind of details um, from personalized, the fact that, you know, the great um, intellectual and writer Robert Reed Farr is like also part of the cast that gives you a sense of this collaborative ecology of folks kind of working together um, that both is indexing and standing apart, right, from what those kind of conditions of production that they're trying to um, fantasize or give you an image of um, visually in the pictures. But I also think, too, I mean, that 
that that credit list, maybe to go back to Rebecca, to something you were saying in your introduction about that transparency, does something really, you know, powerful because it underlines that, you know, this is not, say, couple in a cage, right, where it's, or this is not like a work by the yes man, it's not something parafictional where it's part of like, do you kind of buy this ruse for a minute, but instead really emphasizing that this is a production that's made by a group of people for a particular end, and understanding the need of that production and that construction, right, and to be kind of transparent about it, to be transparent about it. It's not about trying to pull the wool over your eyes, but trying to, in a certain way to um, induct you into the sort of process of an archive's construction, right, and to think about your own kind of position and relationship to all these sort of structures of memory and power as well. Yeah, and I think that you actually sort of see that in, in other works of Zoe also. I mean, it's not, mm -hmm. it's akin to the way that she always includes the black frame in her photographs. It's yes. pointing to um, the image as constructed as uh, to both an image and an, and an object in, in, in a way that's highlighting what we usually take for granted. You know, the idea that often we see an archive and we just sort of like assume it fell from the sky, you know, mm -hmm. instead of um, thinking about the way it is, it is put together from from pieces, um, and I think going back to um, Huey and Gary, what, I mean, what you were talking about in terms of um, putting something together, making scenes in in your film. I'm wondering if maybe it would make sense to talk about your film a little bit more for you to give a description, maybe, and then we can watch. We have a, a one minute clip that we yeah. can show, and then we can sort of talk about them in relation to each other. Yeah, no, it's actually a good sort of I think jumping in point because, um, and it, I'll try to be somewhat brief, but I think just speaking about collaboration. That, you know, I found this film, the MoMA found um, a film that Burt Williams was starring in in 1913. And um, Burt Williams was, uh, you know, a Caribbean born performer. He made, I think, three films altogether, not many, but was making more money than the president during his time period. So it was really well known. Um, and the MoMA thinks it's the very first feature length film uh, with an all black cast and integrated production. And that's very significant. Um, when, when did they find the film again? Say that again? When did they come across the film again? So this was in 1913. Okay. Um, and in 1890, or they found it in 2013, yeah. I'm sorry, okay. 100 years later. So, and it's significant because in 1896, and I'm probably I'm not going to get too numerical with you guys, but that's when Plessy versus Ferguson happened. So sort of like the beginning of Jim Crow, the modern day projector was also invented that same year. So it was the first time people were able to, sh to share a space and watch something. Um, but there was a huge body of work that was made during this time period. And I was really struck when I saw this footage um, that despite Burt Williams wearing blackface, which was a requirement, I think people don't always realize you had to do that if you were gonna be on camera, he almost like cut a deal with these producers. And he said, there isn't a single, you know, there's a few, but it's within context. And he sort of sacrificed himself. He said, I will wear blackface so that no one else in this film has to do that. And you basically have, I think, maybe one of the earliest examples of leisure and joy and people having a great time and looking amazing. Um, and he's a very tall guy, he was like, huge and you see him positioning himself and moving around space in a way where you sometimes don't even notice him he really falls into the crowd and so it felt like a really radical and progressive film but also a very generous and sort of um, great example of strategy and how to get around um, oppression during that time period so uh, I was reading about it in the newspaper and there was a survey at the bottom of the article that said that 70 percent of the films made between 1912 and 1929 are missing and so it's, again, really significant that we find this film made in 1913 that was an in, a hugely progressive body of work. And so I made an assumption that perhaps the 7,500 films that are missing were equally as progressive um, and made a case to make 12 of them. <laughs> and hopefully, you know, we can commission more work to, to fill that gap. Um, so I, I, shot, I sort of tried to con confine myself to formal the restrictions of it being silent, being on 35 millimeter film for the purpose of archive. Um, and I went categorically starting in 1915, which is when Birth of a Nation was made, um, which is also the reason they think this film was never seen, um, and made 12 short silent films that are each dealing with a moment or individual in black history that have also sort of become invisible. Um, and then we're sort of taking bits and pieces from the Burt Williams source material. Should we, can we play it? But this, this has sound, though. This yeah, one there's minute. Sound. Okay. Yeah, there's yeah. music.
One thing I didn't mention is that Trevor Matheson did the music on it, who, and Trevor was a part of the Black Audio Film Collective, which happened in the UK in, in the 90s. Um, and he was a really crucial part of thinking about the sound and, and the music. Um, and I will just very quickly say that I think part of, you know, this, for instance, was most of the film was shot with people who were actively participating and using their craft in New Orleans. And so it was, you know, hearkening to the past, but it was also a documentation of activities and practices that are currently happening. And I think that Watermelon Woman is a really amazing example of exactly the same thing, where it's, it's both hearkening to sort of the archive, but it is also proving a community and sort of making real and visible a community that would otherwise not be seen at the same time. And so the scene that we just watched is um, a baptism, essentially. Yeah. But you also have these other moments you're talking about um, that you mentioned, the um, Boy Scouts, uh, or um, a young girl listening to the radio, or um, a pilot, a woman pilot, uh, like in the early part of the uh, 20th century, um, as sort of moments or, or vignettes in which you're filling in gaps in a, in a way that I think it does echoes with the kind of critical fabulation, if we're using, if we're going to use that term, that's happening in, in Zoe's work. And um, yeah, I think that's, yeah. it's interesting to think about that, that work and um, as a kind of parallel practice, yeah. um, as a imaging of kinds of joy and pleasure, um, to get back to what we were talking yeah, and I think, I mean, one of the things that was so um, striking for me about watching the film is that um, there's a, it made me sort of hark back to this great essay by Elizabeth Alexander called Can You Be Black and Look at This? And it's about what it meant to be like a black person watching the Rodney King videotapes. And she has all this kind of amazing um, reportage and news commentary of people, you know, black folks just seeing that and having this literal bodily energic connection and sort of sensing that um, kind of vulnerability, right, themselves. And I think with your film, there is that, there's a, I had a similar kind of transitive energic energy, but I was like, whew, it wasn't, <laughs> it was about a certain kind of joy in movement. So I was really, there's this incredibly beautiful sequence um, where these, a um, couple fellows are like swing baseball bats oh, yeah. and they just have this incredible like slowed down kind of balletic sumptuousness to them. So just trying to think, you know, about the ways in which these, it's a film that kind of is working on this affective and haptic register as well, that it's somehow getting in your body and giving you kind of a different body than you experience in watching obviously the Rodney King videotape, right? That's opening on to um, a different set of kind of sensual possibilities that aren't in the archive, right? Um, but that you're kind of actively trying to produce for us. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think that's something that I definitely, and I, I would, I definitely think about that in terms of like when you're making work, and I know that Cheryl was also, she talks about this, I mean, Cheryl and Zoe together were talking about, you know, how do you, how do you make work not for everybody, but in a way that can be seen and understood by everybody. And when you're working with archive, when you're working with the past, there are so few spaces, you know, you really have to be careful about how you use that stuff. Uh -huh. And we started making this when, you know, Obama was still president. And I was trying to finish the film once Trump got elected, and I really struggled with how to work with the source material, how to work with the Burt Williams, with, with blackface. and. Uh -huh and the way in which it was going to be interpreted in the scene. And I think I found, you know, I basically just went through the film frame by frame and found moments, and this is something I talked about with the Astor, like, how the fuck do I do this shit? And, you know, it's like freaking out. And, and I just went through every frame of the film and found these moments where his back was turned or he was covering his face. And I opened the film with an image of him not in blackface. And then I find the moving moments that are beautiful and that he is being the most generous with, with those around him. And um, so, yeah, the, the way in which we physically respond to things, I think, is a really interesting point. And, um, and I think also goes back to the archive, too, with Zoe and Cheryl in a lot of ways, in terms of intimacy, maybe, yeah. right? Like, when yeah. we see that amazing love scene between them. Um, 
it's just, you know, when else do you see that on camera? Right. And yeah. the way it's shot, and it's, uh, it really feels like a, it's treated with the same sort of elevated moment of love, of equality, that a Hollywood film would mm -hmm. for a man and a woman. And then in America, at the very end, there's that last shot from the film where he's, it's him looking out, or, yeah. yeah. You t it's, people haven't seen it, but sort of, do you want to describe that, sh that last, that, sure. that still shot in the film? Yeah, yeah, so the film ends, um, it's actually not the real ending of, of, the, of the archival film, but um, everyone's sort of dancing, and, and um, it's actually a moment that I was able to find going through the frames, because it's, uh, you know, when you shoot on film, there's this really funny thing where everything freezes for a second before, uh, before the rollout yeah. happens. And so it's sort of a still image within the moving image. Yeah. And one of the actors is talking to one of the producers, black actor is talking to a white producer, and it freezes on this moment of him grabbing his arm. The actor grabs the producer's arm, but it's in this way, it's a real sense, it's camaraderie. And, and then you see another actor in the background looking directly into the camera. And, um, and Bert actually is less visible. He's, you, can, you really, if you look at the image, he's not, you really have to look for him. Um, and so there's, I, fe I felt like the power dynamics that we're talking about here just were extremely uh, evident there. And so I just held that frame as long as possible. Such a beautiful way to end it too, because the actor who's looking forward, like I totally get into the like, this is looking towards a future. This is mm -hmm. looking towards like, we're representing this now, looking towards the future that we're receiving it in. Like I was just so in that moment when I was watching it. Um, and I think like, you know, Watermelon Woman also has all of these moments that are like looking towards to a futurity that is now like, show the needs working at a VHS store, which is like an obsolete yeah. technology. We talked about that, you know, so there's all of these kind of temporalities that are coming into play too that I think are really interesting. But I, and I think there's something really interesting about this kind of focus on, needing to focus kind of on the still moment, right? To like, in order to read this film against the grain and to find these other moments that can signify differently. Because if you're just watching the films that unfold, it might seem, oh yes, here's a kind of like problematic gesture of racist presumption. But trying to find this kind of moment of undecidability to open it up onto something else. And I think it's interesting that, you know, the Floyd Richards photo archive, it's a photo archive, right? It's not like clips from um, these, that they made for these, you know, to give you this into the movies, which would be again a kind of rescripting of Fay Richards, right, within these con constrained roles. But it's let's take these stilled moments, right, that because they're not already placed within a cinematic narrative, open onto a certain kind of ambivalence, right, where something else that exceeds perhaps the desire of the film or the filmmaker can become visible for a minute. Yeah, I wonder if we might um, think about the work uh, and the ethics of, of that work as a kind of model for, for making. I mean, one of the, um, I'll say this is the sort of question that came up that I, I was um, nervous about asking, but um, to think about what this work means in this context at this moment, um, what it means to uh, represent um, or make a work that's involved with the representation of a culture other than your own, a body other than your own, namely here, black body. Um, and, you know, these are definitely questions that are coming up for Zoe. You know, she, she worries and talks about, like, how do you depict racist imagery without being racist? You know, mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you make that? And, um, you know, also, what we were talking, we brought up the idea of the, the idea of um, appropriating a form, and I really love the moment where you're like, "Well, I don't know if I really want to use that word because that assumes property." Um, whereas, um, you know, historically, the black body has either been disenfranchised from having property or been property itself. Mm -hmm. So, trying to move away from that. But I, I'm wondering if you guys have any sort of insight into or think about what this work means in this moment. Well, I can say just, you know, that thinking again about process, you know, Cheryl went to Zoe, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that that's sort of where it starts. And that's, and Cheryl was in a position to say, I'm making this film, do you want to join me? And I think that that um, immediately sets a tone, I guess, for a power dynamic or lack thereof. Um, and, you know, in terms of, I guess, like, and I, I just, I feel like that is so clearly just through and through, the whole, 
visually, you know, the aesthetics of it, you just really, um, you see that. You know, I know that's a simple answer, but. I've that it's a collaboration. Yeah, yeah. it just yeah. feels like a true collaboration. And the economics of it, I think, are, are important, you know? Like, mm -hmm. that this was a black woman who had the money and ha was in the position to be making the film, and she brought it to Zoe. And I think that you can't sort of tie away compensation from mm. equality. That's always, especially with filmmaking and art making, it's always going to be at the bottom of, like, well, how are people actually getting paid? How are they being compensated? Who's being brought in or, or taken out? Yeah, and I think, I mean... There's a way in which, in that kind of collaboration, I mean, it's, yes, it's about black women's history, but it's also queer history, it's lesbian, specifically lesbian history and black lesbian history. Um, and so I think um, part of it, you know, to get this point about ethics is the incredible, I think, care that Cheryl and Zoe kind of thought about this with and this concern for the subjects and the historical position that they were trying to articulate or kind of fabulate a, an archive around. And so for me, there's a sense in which, you know, these histories, um, they are all of our inheritance, right? I mean, to your point of this notion of, I, you know, to, to sort of insist upon property as something belong to me is on the one hand to um, reproduce this like logic of the system of property which has not really done that many good things for black folks in the first place um, but I think also to make it easier for us not to do the hard ethical work that we all need to do to think about how are we implicated and positioned in relationship to these histories and to understand the limits of those structural positions, what I can and cannot say, but also to develop, given where I am in relationship to these histories and how I'm implicated in them, what is it that I can do to engage this material in a kind of respectful way that honors it and honors the work of all of these women who came before whose lives cannot be thought, right? So I think it's, yeah, really about a kind of, um, what's the kind of care? And I, I think, um, I'm thinking about Lorna Simpson's work in another context that developed this notion of like tending toward blackness, um, both in the sense of like leaning into and caring for, and I think that's what we see in something like the Faye Richards photo archive project, this really, this tending towards blackness in terms of not blackness being just a kind of racial identity, but a structural identity of the forgotten, the marginalized, as well as the racialized. I think for me, just briefly, um, you know, like myself as a queer woman of color, like this work was actually sort of my entry into Zoe's work. It was the first work of Zoe, Zoe's I ever knew, and I knew it from the film. Um, so there is, I mean, it almost seems like obvious now, but like there's this way in which I found myself represented in the film and in this in the Faye Richards photo archive that like was totally giddy making for me mm. in its first moment. Um, so I think, you know, I, I feel gratitude towards it in that way, just to be like I'm really grateful that it exists. And then I think there's also something about the fact that this book I was looking at it. I've had this for a long time, but you know, it was fifteen dollars. Um, like, there's a distribution thing. Like, there's this idea that this is accessible. Yes. Um, and this is something that you know, it's a modest book that you can have on your shelf, and it sits there as like a companion to, I don't know, those days when you feel underrepresented. Um, <laughs> so I think that's there's something to be said for that too. Should. Do you want to open it up to questions now? Should we open it up to questions? Sure. sure. If there are any. We can just keep talking forever. <laughs> <laughs> Who here has seen Watermelon Woman? Okay, three people. <laughs> it's really good. I'd only seen it in the context of working on this show. Um, uh, but you can actually you can access it online, and I and you can actually access it through a subscription to some channel, and then cancel the channel after you watch it. So it's kind of free. It's a free trial. Life hacks with Rebecca yeah. Madelon. Yeah. <laughs> um, that was actually, I guess, if no one has a question, I was I was going to ask everyone what their first encounter with uh, the Faye Richards photo archive was. Actually, I think it was at the retrospective. It was at the Whitney really recently. 
And I, when I watched it too, I mean, when I was looking at it, it's, and this isn't something we necessarily talked about, but I think the materiality and the actual, the paper yeah. that she's working with is just when you, you know, I really recommend everybody if you haven't, they're so close to us, so go see it if you can. Um, but they are on, you know, they're old pictures. They're, the way that they were processed was, they look like old images. I thought it was real. Did you want to ask a? It, it's kind of like a, a, I might have misunderstood or not heard correctly, but I was just curious about um, the, the, the collaboration aspect, obviously, between Cheryl and Zoe, and all that's very clear and illuminated, so thank you. Um, but um, what I didn't know was when Watermelon Woman was made, did and then did Zoe see that, or did she want to work with um, Cheryl immediately, or how? How? Like I'm a little confused by that, and I'm sorry if you no, aren't no, no. Been clear about that. So Cheryl was in the process of formulating the Watermelon Woman, which was originally going to be a documentary, I believe, um, and asked Zoe, knowing Zoe um, as a photographer, okay. Okay. asked her if she would create um, essentially props and archive of okay. images for the film, um, which Zoe shot. Uh, the shooting was actually over a year. So that's also another aspect, like the working together for a year in Chicago, in New York City with these actors, creating, you know, I think she had, she said like a, like a list of 50 kinds of different images she wanted to create. Um, and then Cheryl uses the photographs in the film, which comes out in 96. And then Zoe, I think, I, I, I'm almost positive Zoe asked Cheryl if she could use those photographs to create a work of its own. And so then it is um, first seen in the Whitney in 97. And I should say also that in 1997, it's not under glass in a vitrine. Yeah. It's so presented on the wall, though. Um, you, so we would never let you do that now. <laughs> and it doesn't um, have the captions. It looks like, or maybe there's. It looks like maybe um, there's like a booklet or something. That has I, the captions. I think it's separate. So the captions are separate in that instance. And then actually yeah. the um, the version. So there there are three uh, editions of the work, which is also something strange to think about. Which I don't know if I was having this cover, but like how how you make an edition of something in which each print is also kind of its own original. Mm -hmm. But so. Um, uh, Two are in collections, and then the third she actually dispersed to the cast members themselves. So she gave out prints to the people that were that worked on on the film with her. But um, the version we have here, um, the owner has it or had it originally presented in um, the kind of um, uh, I guess framing that you would have for family photographs, um, which isn't the way that you're supposed to present it, but it was at one moment, which is also another thing. And she, the owner actually has them mixed in with her own wow. like family photographs in her home, which is Amazing. interesting. Yeah. Hey, you guys. Um, I, I have always, uh, always thought about the, the kind of ethical quandaries that, that surround this piece also, especially over the past several years as, as similar quandaries. <coughs> have come up around other artworks um, uh, dealing with, you know, who has the right to represent what. Um, and one of the things that strikes me about this piece, apart from the fact that it is fiction, um, is, is its utility. You know, often, you are, often archives are, are thought to, or, or are used to represent or stand for the veracity of the past. And the, the, uh, we get into um, kind of territorial battles about who who can use that veracity? But this is a contemporary artwork made in the '90s, um, and it and it seems to me to be forward-looking. It's sort of about the future. Mm -hmm. Not, I mean, yes, it represents the past, and yes, that past was real in many ways, and yes, it can be documented. But this is a work made by people that were working in the '90s and thinking about what could be, and what might be, and what should be, and that I think does something different to the whole argument that we always have about white people representing black experience. And um, I don't know, it's worth maybe thinking about some. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that's a, a, a really great point, Bennett. And I think um, it takes me sort of back to Hartman and when she's trying to theorize critical fabulation that the orientation of it is, is towards some imagined free state that has not yet arrived, right? That I'm not gonna produce a certain violence pretending that that free state was there then. And I'm not going to try to narrate its coming into being, but I'm going to work as if it will somehow materialize. And I think that is the kind of ambition of this project that you're so nicely kind of pointing to. I mean, there's also just the, the context of it. I mean, being made during the plague years of the AIDS crisis and like that kind mm -hmm. of futurity of like, when you're thinking about how disproportionately queer bodies and black bodies were affected by the AIDS crisis and continue mm -hmm. to be, um, and like what it means to, to make that kind of work, this sort of um, projective work for a future to come. Yes. It's, you know, that's intense. And I, th I think too, I mean, I mean, because I remember, so my first encounter with this was with, was with the film, not with the project. Then I saw the project after, I was like, what, it's amazing. Um, but I think I had this similar kind of experience of Lanka, like, oh my God, this kind of identification, this kind of like black queer visibility that was amazing. And this and also the moment of like tongues untied in the early 90s, all these kind of really great interventions. Um, but I think that, you know, it's really important that it's a black queer woman that's kind of being pictured here in that in a historical moment, especially, you know, if we think about, you know, so many contestations around the politics of the crisis tended to focus on men and tended to focus on kind of white gay men. And, you know, just thinking about the importance of, you know, Zoe's activism and of so many queer women and queer folks of color, right? Um, that though this work isn't kind of directly related to that um, in terms of what it's doing, I think as we revisit it historically, it's this really kind of important moment of queer, black, female visibility that again offers us a kind of counterfactual from the whitewashed narratives and the you know, gender watch narratives of the crisis that we often get, right? To think about, yeah, how, how, how do we understand the ways in which, you know, women and people of color mattered to that moment? Because the narratives that we're getting from that are increasingly about effacing them, right? <coughs> Um, hi, so I think you were already kind of talking about the power dynamics between the collaboration, but I, I was curious to hear your thoughts on how much you feel the archive is a product of queerness versus black queerness, and if that is even the right question to ask, or, is that, or maybe that's something that isn't important or not important. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I mean, I think one of the things that I find so deeply compelling about this is it's like when I think about formative works for me that really model a kind of intersectionality, like this is like, exactly. it's so deeply intersectional and mm -hmm. it talks about all the thorny, like when I was talking about the Martha Page, like that one photograph where like there's awkward power dynamics, like it really, it doesn't shy away from those things. Um, it some, does sometimes approach them obliquely. But, um, you know, yes, like she's a queer black actress and her life experiences tether to all different kinds of um, power dynamics, racial dynamics that are both troubling and uh, ecstatic. And um, so I would say, you know, it feels like it's not queer or black, it's just like deeply in its intersection mm -hmm. of also, I think, feminist art making in the 90s as well. That work in particular? Yes. Um, so I guess I'd say the question came up as to whether to include that work. It was, so this exhibition um, was organized by MOCA by myself and Bennett Simpson, who asked a really good question. Um, and um, uh, when presented, it opened at the Whitney, and the Whitney included the Fay Richards Photo Archive, which has always been on 
the checklist. Um, part of that is because uh, as a survey or a retrospective of Zoe's work, it is a sort of pivotal work, not sort of, it's a pivotal work, a key work in um, what she's making um, in her career, which begins really in the early 80s um, and includes um, her work as an activist, a photographer, a sculptor, and all the intersections between. Um, so I guess I can, I can talk about it specifically in the context of the room that it's in, um, which is to say that it's in what we sort of call the museum works room. And all those works, um, both directly and indirectly, have to deal with uh, uh, the way that bodies or genders or um, uh, people are represented in uh, museological spaces, or not represented to some extent, um, and the way that gender is constructed. Um, you know, the Faye Richards photo archive, again, is, has uh, an important history, um, and as Amanda mentioned in the introduction, had never been shown in Los Angeles. Um, it's currently on view at MoCA right now here, as well as in um, Outliers, Lynn Cook show at uh, LACMA. And I think we all felt it was important to be able to have it in both locations. There was a moment, I think, when Zoe was like, well, it's gonna be up somewhere else. But I think having it, um, first of all, in two really different kinds of contexts, one that is a solo show and one that sort of gives you a view onto the way it might relate to other works um, in Zoe's body, in like the trajectory of what she's making, um, but also in the way that it's related to other kinds of work being made at LACMA. Um, yeah, I don't know if that helps. It's a long process <laughs> of going with checklist over and over again and getting loans and not getting loans and yeah. Well, I guess I'd say it, it's shown consistently since it was made in 97. It hasn't been here. Um, but I do think part of what you're asking is the implications, and I think we've talked about this, like what the implications are on view right now, which have less to do with the work to some extent with where we are, where we're at in this moment. Um, yeah, I don't know if anyone else wants to. Just a, just a little more factual context. This, this um, like a lot of works that use photography, this, is, this work is an addition. Um, there are um, at least three other versions of, of the piece. Uh, there is one, one version is owned by the Whitney Museum in New York. One version is owned by the Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, one version is owned by a private collector here in, in Los Angeles. The version that we have in the other room is, is that one from a private collector. And then there is a, the version that's on view at LACMA is an artist proof, I believe. It's not an art, it's not a DAP. No, that's the one, um, Philadelphia. Or no, it's, um, I forget which one that is, but that's, so there are three, and then the fourth, which was an AP, was the one that was broken up. You're right. Okay. Anyway, the, it, like, 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 like works of photography, it's editioned, and so it can be shown. It's kind of interesting that it's in two different yeah. museums in the same city at the same time. I mean, that rarely happens. Um, and I think, I mean, to me, that's a really wonderful opportunity to, because I've seen this work in relationship to other work. So that it was shown at the MCA Chicago, um, an exhibition um, that was pairing Zoe with Cindy Sherman and Lorna Simpson. So seeing it in these kind of different contexts shifts the kind of valence of it and I think really opens up the kind of multiplicity in terms of where it can kind of take you intellectually. And I think for me even like seeing it in relationship to different kinds of practices, I start you know, thinking about different kinds of narrative constructions and structures that might exist or don't exist between the photographs. So I think it allows you to really sort of be open to the work's evolution over time. And I think, you know, it's a great moment for you know Zoe to be having this retrospective because I think there's a way that for me, you know, we live in a world where we're kind of inundated by images and, and you know there's a certain kind of ease and um, constant traffic in the photographic, but Zoe is someone who's always thinking really deeply about 
what it means to photograph, what the sort of ethics are, and are always thinking about, you know, what am I looking at and how is that looking constructed and wanting to show that to you. And I think in this particular moment of, um, you know, rapid image circulation and falsity to have an artist with that kind of integrity and vision, not only in her practice, but then also in what it means for us as viewers in terms of how we might rethink and retrain ourselves as lookers is incredibly vital. Yeah, her, her work demands time in a way, slowness, mm -hmm. you know, it's yes. not, there's a kind of different kind of time or rhythm to mm -hmm. the way we are used to approaching photographs, which is on a screen. Thank you to our brilliant panelists.